till the task is over. But for last six months or so, family members and friends have noted episodes of increased irritability, restlessness, excessive time spent in online activities. He himself reports excessive thoughts, doubts that people are spying on him through all these technologies and also reports that sometimes the voices in his head confirm this. This onset was after he failed in an exam where he could not complete the paper. He ran out of time due to not being satisfied with the answers and he kept correcting it again and again. Now, these episodes of irritability and restlessness, they are not continuous throughout six months. They come and go at a time for two, five days. And then he goes back to baseline when he remains aloof, withdrawn. He does not have any motivation to work or to complete the task. He is not even taking care of himself. So what would we diagnose this person? At cross-section, he would be diagnosed differently. But what is actually happening to this brain? To understand that, the context or background that we, the lens we are looking through is that the brain dysfunction produces symptoms. And these symptoms sometimes have overlapping biology and they are due to difficulty in managing what we can say load. Technical terms will come on later on. But in previous session, we have spoken about allostatic load. This is in context of that. Hello. Yeah, you can carry on, Nachike. Yeah, so the diathesis or the vulnerability condition is already there on which there is excess load which when brain is not able to manage, there will be symptoms. But we do have different redundancies and buffers so that there is a sort of functional range within which we can manage loads. But And when the things go beyond that, uh, these systems are overwhelmed, then we start seeing the symptoms. Another factor is that because of these redundancies and other changes, sometimes these things are not specific to one particular stimulus. Let's say uh, if it is a fever or it's a other health issue or it's a psychological stressor, ultimately at brain level, it affects the allostasis practically the same way. And these changes can be clinically seen in terms of sympathetic overactivity, tachycardia, and, but they are not specific. With that background, let us try to understand what actually it means. There are various different models explained about stress and diathesis interactions. But all in all, what they mean is there is a vulnerability situation, diathesis. Let's say somebody has a diathesis for diabetes. That means this person's body will not be able to handle glycemic load as well as the person who does not have diathesis. Similarly here, there is an existing yeah, diathesis on which there is a physiological or biological stress. And after a point when the capacity is exhausted, okay. the functional range or the cognitive reserve, we can say, then it starts producing symptoms. So, as discussed in introduction, mania and psychosis do have commonalities. Psychosis from biological point of view is intermittent or continuous hyperactivity of brain excitation processes and its associated neuroendocrine and immune system dysfunctions also. All these combined lead to various symptoms and they are not limited to just behavioral symptoms. We commonly hear physicians say that stress is causing you hypoglycemia or hypertension. That is also connected here. At intracellular and cellular level, there is huge level overlap in mania, psychosis, or what we consider schizophrenia spectrum disorders, which essentially is a cellular hyperactivity and dysfunction 
which gradually leads to cellular wear and tear and senescence. Ultimately, there is apoptosis, neurodegenerative changes. This is all happening across life. But this cellular processes, despite of them being similar in many and psychosis, they lead to different kind of symptoms because the these various symptoms develop as emergent properties. What does that mean? Nachiketa, Nachiketa, just hang on. Just hold for a second. Just hold for a second. Uh, please, everybody, just mute yourselves. It's a request for everybody to mute themselves. Let the speak. So the emergent properties are where a component and its function and multiple components together lead to certain new properties they are, that are not part of the individual component. Here, the cellular function and cellular pathology may be same in many and psychosis. But when they come together, different cells form a circuit and different regions of brain which handle relatively different functions. Nowadays, we talk of different circuits implicated for different uh, symptoms. That is how these symptoms emerge out of common shared cellular pathology. And this concept has been explained by Diros in terms of the visual depiction of symptoms of psychosis overlapping with our clinical DSM and ICD diagnosis. As shown here, the psychosis phenotype or the psychosis process, whatever you want to call it, is not just seen in schizophrenia, but also bipolar, also major depressive disorders, schizoaffective disorders. So that is why to con we need to look at the biology of psychosis as a single phenotypical concept rather than DSM or ICD diagnostic label. And in that context, Charney et al. also proposed to look at dimensional liability model in context of diathesis. So in left right half, they have shown the older categorical model of diathesis and in lower half, here is the dimensional model where they have considered three spectrums, depressive symptoms, psychotic symptoms, and manic symptoms. And Combination of all those three at three different dimensions are what is clinically getting labeled as bipolar or schizoaffective or schizophrenia. And all these developments primarily came to focus with business, that is, bipolar and schizophrenia network for intermediate phenotypes. They try to look at brain and think what is happening and study that. They studied it from micro level to macro level, used all available tools and techniques, EEG, fMRI, and found three different biotypes, of which biotype 1 had low electrical activity, biotype 2 had high electrical activity. Primarily, they focused on hippocampal area, which will also be the focus of our discussion today. Now, to, one caveat is that the neurobiological discussion on this topic is huge. I will be just giving an outline through the example of hippocampal area and its associated pathologies. So biotype 1, low electrical activity, biotype 2, high. And biotype 3 was curiously associated with high prevalence of cannabis use. How did they measure the neuronal activation and activity? They considered CFOS as the marker of neural activation. And they tried to see how clinically relevant it is. They came to know that clozapine increases this activity. And that is why seizure risk was slightly higher in biotype 2. And treatment response was slightly better in biotype 1. So this is how studying this neurobiology can actually have clinical implications. Let's go it into, into it a bit deeper. It starts at gene level, which is conception and antenatal period, when body is actually forming, brain is actually forming. Various genes get affected by various sorts of mutations, and these mutations need not be on and off situation. 
they they are then over the period of life time they get exposed to various situations environmental stressor which add epigenetic changes how do we understand that let's imagine there is a recipe book which has fixed type written recipe that is similar to gene and genetic code based on which proteins are formed what are these epigenetic changes epigenetic changes are like the corrections we make in that printed cookbook we cut out certain part of recipe we may add, scribble something additionally we may add something let's say more salt is needed this kind of correction changes are what we can equate epigenetic changes with these are some of the examples of those epigenetic changes in terms of nuclear rna changes post translational histone modifications dna methylation changes of these probably dna methylation term in context of epigenetics is probably as popular as bgnf in general neurobiological terms but there are many other factors associated all these gene polymorphism it affecting gene function ultimately leads to changes in production of various proteins we can say cellular proteome is affected and these are proteins may be structural like microtubular proteins or it may be function change like enzymes and other components of various intracellular cascades all these leads to not so smooth functioning of cell which adds metabolic load in terms of mitochondrial or endoplasmic reticular dysfunction or stress this leads to wear and tear to cell and the damaged parts which usually are cleared by ubiquitin and other scavenger systems either they get overwhelmed the capacity is over or those gene polymorphisms directly affect these scavenger systems and so the damaged parts are not cleared completely and they get accumulated in cell over a period of time this also includes reactive oxygen species and related changes at grosser level histopathological level we can see there are lewy bodies in parkinsonian pathologies that can be considered one of the examples of this kind of accumulation this leads to cellular cell lesions which triggers intrinsic or extrinsic apoptotic pathways and which ultimately leads to cell death and gradually macro level gray matter volume loss this simple pictorial representation was taken from an article about neurobiology of depression but it can hold true for almost all the symptoms we discuss as we can see here there is individual response against environment because of all those redundancies that we discussed at internal level it gets translated to some non specific but important changes that are common to either psychological or biological stressors these lead to activation of corresponding neural circuits let's say hypovigilance and amygdala hyperactivity and related changes which lead to cellular cell membrane level changes in terms of neurotransmitter receptors neurotropic factors bdnf as we mentioned and other modulators this ultimately carry the signal inside the cell in form of various second messenger systems and intracellular signaling cascades which converge on certain common factors like c response element binding protein they go into cell affect the dna and epigenetic changes all the system ultimately change the balance between neurogenesis and apoptosis we can consider neurogenesis as an a place holder for growth and repair system the scavenger system cell repair system or the balance shift away from surviving cell and repairing cell towards now program cell death that we call apoptosis and that is how this intracellular and cellular level changes affect cell function and ultimately at gross level regional function and with lead to various symptoms through disruption of various circuits these are the examples of intracellular cascades akt pathway p10 pathway gsk3 beta pathway they need not be completely stop working even the imbalance is enough to produce cell dysfunction and ultimately symptoms these are the 
this is a pictorial representation of the two apoptotic pathway we talked about extrinsic and intrinsic extrinsic as shown here fast ligand and above that external factors affect the cell and trigger the apoptotic pathways internally these are the situation that are triggering bcl2 pathway this is the uh, this one caspase 9 pathway in this yellow boxes, they have mentioned certain disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, Huntington's disease, schizophrenia. So we can see that same cellular pathology is implicated in multiple different clinical diagnoses. So apart from cellular, intracellular changes, cell surface level changes also occur. Primarily in context of neurons, it is related to synapses. Those genes may affect structural integrity of synapse. Those genes may affect functioning of synapse formation or synaptic pruning, which leads to lower synaptic density. The synaptic pruning term is what we commonly hear in context of schizophrenia, that there is normal pruning, but if there is excess pruning, it affects the brain and produces the diathesis that ultimately leads to schizophrenia symptom. How does that affect at circuit or macro level? This synaptic function affects long-term depression or long-term potentiation, which are the basis of learning and memory. At intercellular level, apart from neurons and synapses, cells also communicate with each other through paracrine and endocrine signaling and also sometimes regulate own function via autocrine functioning. This may also get affected, cell-to-cell -cell communication may get disrupted, which ultimately leads to dysfunction uh, uh, in different circuits. So at macro level, what we see, different brain areas supposedly specialize in different function based on different types of cell present and their connections with neighboring cells and distant cells, which we call as circuits. These also include functioning of non-neuron cells like microglia. Microglia are basically primary immune cells of CNS. And the interaction of these cells with each other via various chemokines affect cellular migration, cellular interconnectivity, and regional circuit formations. This is one example how microglial function affects and produces symptoms. At perinatal period, there were quiescent macroglia, which gets activated and gets primed with the stressors in childhood. Over the period of adolescence and adulthood, this activated microglia contribute to neuroinflammation. It may lead to dysregulated pruning, as we considered before, which ultimately leads to cortical dysregulation, cognitive impairment, and negative symptoms. Now this negative symptoms part is important. As we will see later, the positive symptoms or the psychotic episodes are usually vexing and waning come and go. But most of the time, some negative or cognitive symptoms persist even between those acute episodes. The circuits that we keep talking about, they can be structural circuits like CSTC loop, or they can be functional circuits or functional connectivity. Now, what is that? Functional connectivity is basically when two areas of brain show activity changes in sync with each other or simultaneously. What that means is a function, a, a brain area shows hyperfunction or hypofunction in fMRI. At the same time, the other area can show equal change uh, that is increase in function with increase in function or reciprocal change. One area is lighting up and other area is going down in function. These form functional circuits, current area of interest and area of study. So those are called functional circuits and networks are the, which we commonly are aware of in terms of default mode networks, alliance network, this kind of things. This is one example of how circuits and different cells come together. 
This is the prefrontal cortex area in a subject of schizophrenia. As you can see, there is somatostatin cell, there is gabagic cell, there is parvoalbumin cell, which is again gabagic interneuron. And all these cells are interconnected with each other, affecting functions of each other. Here, we can see various genes implicated in dysfunctions in different levels, which ultimately lead to dysfunction of this circuit. So, even in this small slice and one single circuit, we can see there are so many variables involved. That is why we can probably say that there won't probably be a single gene implicated for a particular, uh, say, schizophrenia or mania. Any of the dysfunction of these and imbalance of these various interdependent functions can lead to the diathesis. This is just a slide describing previous. If anyone wants to take a screenshot, they can. I'll be posing for two, three seconds here. And this is the image slide. Okay, so moving on. These circuits, their function and this function lead to certain fixed longitudinally stable characteristics we know as traits. And these circuits also have feedback loops with each other. They usually don't act alone. A dysfunction of one circuit can lead to compensatory changes in other circuit. And ultimately, all brain areas are affected in all psychiatric disorders. So, what can we do is we can try to understand the profile of dysfunction of these circuits and the traits or the longitudinal stable features that we are considering diathesis. They are not probably in terms of traditional psychological senses or defense mechanisms, but more like impulsivity, compulsivity, working memory, processing speed, aggression, these kind of things. This is one example which shows hippocampus and its connection with other brain areas. We would be focusing on hippocampus because it has been focus of study in schizophrenia for long. We read one line in our standard textbooks that CA3 region of hippocampus is implicated in schizophrenia, but how? This is one example of ventral hippocampal projection that connect with so many other areas. This is nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental area. Now, this part is also in reward circuit and goal-directed activity, and it will be affected in mania also, not just in schizophrenia. That is how we have shared diathesis or shared pathology at circuit or intercellular levels too. This is another connection. Previous one was ventral hippocampal area and its connection. This is about dorsal and its connection with ventral. Here is the mention of dorsal CA3. Thus, various loops function together in coordination in form of structural circuits like CSTC loop or functional connectivity as shown in or as we can see it in fMRI and other brain functional scans. Hippocampus is much studied area. It collects the information from different sensory areas and then integrate them into one memory. And every time we recall events from past, be it autobiographical memory or other things, and then it is re-encoded and stored again in the whatever area they were stored. It's not like brain is just reading the memory. That's why all these memories are liable to changes over a period of time. And Along with hippocampus, basal ganglia and its structures, limbic system, all these are interconnected. They provide incentive alliance, which is out of multiple different stimuli in environment, which stimulus is relevant. That is incentive alliance. And then it is stored along with the whatever outcome and reward and dopaminergic VT and NSE circuits. That is how we learn from experiences. So 
the reward circuit or motivation circuit as we understand in terms of addiction is actually circuit of learning and it has its extension and connection with other area in brain frontal lobe primarily provides top down inhibitory control when to stop different areas have different functions be it ventromedial prefrontal or orbitofrontal or intersingulate or be it dorsolateral prefrontal these ultimately lead to what we clinically see as various traits. They can be autism-like traits, inflexibility, insistence for same routine, difficulty to handle unexpected things, high perseveration, meaning difficulty in letting go. ADHD or impulsivity has opposite side also where there is low perseverance. All these present clinically as anxious traits also what we know as cluster A or cluster C traits primarily. But because those diagnostic categories are based on clinical symptoms, that's not one-to-one -one mapping with these. So cluster B person can also present with psychosis or mania features. Then there are traits associated with chronobiological disturbances. Many of the times we see the deviation in neurodevelopmental trajectory even as young as six months old child where a child has difficulty in establishing sleep-wake cycle, which should be established usually by two, three months of age. These traits evolve over a period of time because epigenetic changes and age-specific gene function changes that are triggered on and off by various genes. So what can it present as a childhood Cross-sectional presentation looks like autism. A child grows a little more. He does not have that typical clinically diagnosable autism where there is poor eye-to-eye -eye contact and difficult non-verbal communication. But they are there at subclinical or traits level, which get labeled as OCPD or schizoid PD, mainly because of the insistence on routine and all those things. If you recall, that case we discussed at the start had this kind of features. It can present as anxiety and depressive features. Then there is period of adolescence where major transitions are happening in body, which leads to production of symptoms. And that is why commonly we see that skis or many of these disorders start somewhere in teenage to early adulthood. Throughout the period of adulthood, it may present as psychosis, mania, or even the bipolar depression presentation cross-sectionally. Person may start taking substance and if the person finds with by trial and error that this substance in a way helps him or her function better, then he would get the label of addiction. But the underlying processes and damage is ongoing that neuroprogression ultimately leads to dementia type features in the old age. This is the full spectrum across lifespan. It need not be present in each and every case. Which is depicted here pictorially. If you can see here, this blue line is interneuron maturation. This red line is mesocortical dopaminergic projections and its functioning. And this black line it has to do with myelination and glutamatergic synapse density. Oh, sorry, this black one is glutamatergic, green one is myelination. Any disruption in these processes, be it environmental stressor, genetic polymorphisms, or other changes, leads to diathesis, which initially leads to prodromal stage and then gradually onset of psychosis in adolescence to young adulthood. And as we briefly mentioned before, it presents as fluctuating course of positive symptoms, which may be more of episodic. Whereas the other aspects of what we consider part of schizophrenia, say negative symptoms, cognitive deficits, they persist throughout. Even when the positive symptoms subside, they may plateau for a while in adulthood, but then at later date, they do so again worsening or decline. 
This is bit more technical slide showing how genetic risk factors and perinatal complications affect neuronal development, which leads to altered synaptic pruning on biological side, along with our favorite maladaptive childhood, which goes on to adolescence. There are other stressors, experiment with substances because adolescence is a period of increased impulsivity. This slowly start forming this aberrant salience. I hope the pointer is visible on screen. That is where prodromal phase or symptoms start. This aberrant salience is relevant. We'll be discussing in next few slides. That leads to attributing significance to non-significant or trivial stimuli in environment, leading to arbitrary inferences and other symptoms. Then they may remit, they may relapse again, or in terms of schizophrenia, we can call it waxing and waning. And with treatment, positive symptoms respond better, but the negative and cognitive symptoms persist. They progress gradually, and in chronic schizophrenia, we see less of positive symptoms, and gradually picture shifts more towards dementia. This particular section shows glutathione-related deficits, the, the, the oxygen species and its related functioning. It affects NMDA function on gabergic neurons, disinhibited glutamatergic neuron, and the dopaminergic aspects lead to glutamatergic excitotoxicity. This is primarily in form of calcium influx, but there are other components also. That triggers, again, those apoptotic pathways cell death, gray matter volume loss. And that's how these cognitive and negative symptoms progress. There are agents that we use commonly day-to-day -day in clinical practice in other conditions that can help with this. So, what is that aberrant science thing? Earliest mention that I could find was in 2003 by Shitish Kapoor, where he gave this framework of psychosis as a state of aberrant salience. Hippocampal hyperactivity has been found as the target or origin of this aberrant salience in schizophrenia. And over a period of time, various studies have shown that dentate gyrus activity, if that activity is affected, it affects CA3 area neuron activity. And that's where slowly the dysfunction starts and the memories are given wrong attributions, even we can say in a sense distorted or false memories. At the same time, aberrant cell lines also leads to interpretation of trivial stimuli as significant at macro scale. Let's just imagine that somebody is giving some glances which are trivial, not important, but because of aberrant cell lines, person perceives it as threatening and that triggers hypervigilance and paranoia and that kind of thing. That is how aberrant salience has relation with first rank symptoms as we described in context of schizophrenia. But as we know, delusion, hallucinations and other so-called positive symptoms are also common in bipolar disorder, even depression. This particular study the authors did was uh, aberrant science inventory and then they tried to correlate with first-line symptoms rather than explaining how aberrant science leads to those symptoms. So how do these symptoms occur neurobiologically? Now this delusion circuit, we study the main circuits of these in our training days. It mentions corticosteroid loop that same loop is also at times implicated in obsessions. Clinically also we see that obsessions without insight are practically same as delusion, very hard to differentiate and probably on the same spectrum from normal transient fleeting doubts to ruminations and obsessions and strongest form being delusions probably. Hypervigilance leads to paranoia as we discussed just few slides back. Now, the hallucinations are interesting part. It is seen that when we have some complex 
multi step behaviors or actions they are integrated and stored basal ganglia gets involved the circuitry is reward circuit learning circuits get involved frontal has top down inhibitory function those are stored as motor or behavioral program copies and they get affected and all this functioning have internal imagery sensory imagery at that level they also share huge overlap with delusion practically same circuit as delusions and some studies have tried to mention that or rather explain that as hierarchical alterations that differentiate hallucination and delusions otherwise same circuit aggression is also common in beat schizophrenia beat mania if you can see almost all psychiatric disorders share this one thing reduced frontal inhibition or what we can say disinhibition and impulsivity that can also be called hypofrontality in one word but there are some differences particularly in psychosis there is striatal hyperactivity and this ventral and dorsal striatal changes also impact delusion formation limbic irritability is more common in this cluster b type symptoms that brings us to negative symptoms low mood and associated negative symptoms as we see flu slides back this one this is how glutamatergic dysfunction and cellular neuronal loss ultimately is implicated in negative symptoms and this almost complements the other hypothesis about positive symptoms and form the whole picture of psychosis phenotype how do they do it this is one example dopaminergic neuron have gabagic interneurons and these are the glutamatergic neurons reduced activation of gabagic neurons or glutamate hyperfunction or increased dopamine release these all things are interconnected and all those previous cellular changes or genetic changes may affect any of these state which leads to abnormal nmda receptor function it affect the cellular plasticity synapse formation and other things and this part the hypoactivity of frontocortical nmda receptor reduces gabagic active interneuron activity that leads to disorganization of neuronal networks volume loss and negative and cognitive symptoms this particular circuit of dorsal lateral prefrontal to dorsal striatum is primarily implicated in goal directed activity and planning for reward acquisition in simplest terms over activation of this circuit would be seen in mania under activation would be seen in negative symptoms depressive symptoms similarly acc ventral striatum circuit it is involved in calculating cost of obtaining rewards and monitoring effort invested and competition this part is also implicated in negative symptoms primarily in e motivation and other associated findings this one is also relevant the previous circuit in anhedonia similarly this orbital frontal to ventral striatal circuit now this particular circuit can be considered associated with compulsivity it probably would also be seen in oc symptoms and part of negative symptoms as well aberrant alliance is not limited to positive and negative symptoms it also leads to disorganization now this term disorganization is relatively vague i could not clearly understand whether it is in context of the impaired self care part or whether it wants to focus on disorganization of psyche in metaphorical sense so neurobiologically cellular and certain circuit level changes and even area implicated are same in many and case but due to different circuits and different emergent properties we do see some differences in clinical presentations and more motivation more hedonic drive more goal directed activity 
is seen in mania. However, more hypervigilance, more anxiety, paranoia, restlessness, this may be more common in active or acute phase of psychotic episode of keys. This one article tries to integrate all the various aspects of neurobiology of mania. It is a bit dense, but it tries to cover immune dysregulation, white matter abnormality, how they affect limbic network, how neurotransmitter changes affect subcortical cortical connections, ultimately leading to psychopathology. But we can say that affectivity is increased in mania. Probably psychotic tendency can also be increased. We commonly see delusion of grandeur and other delusions. Certain activities get reduced. Impulse control gets reduced. In case of depression, almost opposite changes are seen. And this is the area which is affected by these changes and ultimately destabilized circuits. So, ultimately, longitudinally, we see that there are certain stable traits. It may be impulsivity, compulsivity proneness to wrong inferences or jumping to conclusion. There is a term called jumping to conclusion bias. It has been described in literature, which I have not included for the sake of brevity of presentation. And then these table traits are key because as we see, saw in the case we started before, there are episodic hyperactivity which may cross-sectionally look like mania. And then there are in-between in periods which leads to confusion whether they are negative symptoms or depressive symptoms. Then there are hallucinations also, voices telling, almost confirming that the person's inferences or delusions were correct. This way, via longitudinal approach, we can avoid that and we can focus on where we want to work, which traits or which longitudinally stable features we want to address. We can also try to choose molecule based on the profile of that person's pathology and matching that with molecular action of medicine. People have described molecular mechanism of antipsychotics also and how they can match. And I would even go one step beyond. We can try to understand which non-communicable diseases commonly co-occur. It can give us an insight. For example, a person with mania or psychosis having certain intracellular dysfunction, it is also leading to proneness to metabolic syndrome. This is well documented and well researched uh, fact we can say. That is how those who already have schizophrenia or bipolar diathesis are already prone to metabolic syndrome. Now that person receiving a lens up in and getting let's say hypoglycemia or weight gain is not wholly dependent or wholly attributable to olanzapine alone. There are cases where very high doses when given to a person with keys or bipolar, they actually show weight loss. It is not clearly explained, but this is a clinical phenomenon at times seen. And depending on those functions, intercellular functioning, how medicines affect that, where it can help, we can actually demonstrate the benefits of our psychotropics, not only in our disorders, but also in other conditions. For example, chemosensitizing properties. Olanzapine also has antiemetic properties, and that can actually convey the importance of psychotropics to non-psychiatric colleagues also. However, I realize that this is a bit utopian context and this concept will take time to fully emerge. We have not completely arrived there, but at least if we keep this mindset and approach, slowly we can start noticing patterns and then different clinicians independently observing these patterns can come together and confirm what we can say replication and find out what are these patterns. For example, one pattern is that ADHD, hypertension, impulsive aggression, these tend to go together in family history. And because of this, sometimes they have 
history of calming or downness or sedating substances, for example, alcohol or benzodiazepine dependence. Now, this is my observation. If it matches with observation of other people, then it can be a pattern and it is replicated and then we can probably work on maybe publishing it and make it a part of scientific literature. This is the article that shows molecular mechanism of antipsychotics, how they affect intracellular pathways, epigenetics, and post-transcription processes. And because of that, it has been now being repurposed for cancer treatment also. So our patients share their thesis with many of the cancer syndromes and our medicines not only correct our pathologies but help there also. Just recently, I am dealing with a case of glioblastoma in aged person who is presenting dementia with BPSD. That person is actually responding very well to addition of olanzapine and memante. So how to integrate all those findings? This is one example how various psychotropics are affecting intracellular pathways and ultimately affecting reduced apostosis or reduce this pathology and improving cellular function that is primarily related to SSRI and these things. Whereas antipsychotics may probably trigger apoptosis in certain condition and that's how they are helping in cancer. Coming back to the case, the person had autistic or non-castic traits since childhood. He displayed high perseverance, completing tasks taken at hand. He was prone to anxiety because of that perfectionism and difficulty in moving on to next question, he could not complete the exam. That added to his psychological stress and slowly the changes started occurring, appearing. He probably had amygdala hyperactivity, hippocampal changes as discussed before. Aberrant silences led to him believing that so-and-so things, which are trivial events. Other people would probably not notice. Let's say you are passing on road and another vehicle is passing on same road behind you. It is usually non-threatening, but under this kind of state, person will feel that the that other vehicle is following him. This led to surgical answers online and already he had esoteric interest. So all the explanations and that presented the, the answer seeking part presented as increased goal directed activity because of anxiety and this thing he was also restless non goal directed activity was increased had paranoia and he would get angry on family members when they would try to counter his views and explain although they were well meaning and trying to explain that this is not the reality so these were the episodic hyperactivities which correlate with either positive symptoms or cross-sectionally gets diagnosed as mania and in between he would slip back into negative and depressive symptoms, a motivation and those things. Ultimately he got better with olanzapine and fluoxetine. Fluoxetine was continued but olanzapine could be tapered down to 2.5 after roughly 3 months of symptom free in terms of positive symptoms a sort of a remission period so what medicines have a role antipsychotics as we know acute phase particularly positive symptoms we need to give higher doses we may be able to taper it off because let's say we have given antipsychotics it is not just reducing function of amygdala and other associated areas but it is also reducing function of other brain areas the moment acute episode is over, within few days, the person will start showing other dysfunctions, what we call secondary negative symptoms or antipsychotic induced negative and cognitive features. That only means that we need to tone down on antipsychotic or we need to tone down on the breaks. At the same time, antidepressants will improve uh, primarily frontal prefrontal functioning and improve top-down control. And that will actually improve the ability to discern non-threatening from threatening and all those sorts of things. 
regarding that glutamatergic excitotoxicity we discussed before, memantine is the agent that can reduce that. So there is a possibility that it can slow down the progression. However, for the moment, it would be an off-label use and it would have to be justified with proper rationale should it be questioned as deviating from guidelines. But there are studies, they are showing especially the uh, negative and cognitive symptoms related improvement after addition of memantine. I have one patient who was stable on risperidone for quite long time, decades, and then he started showing some impulsivity and some dysfunctions at later age, which would have been labeled as dementia symptoms, but he got better only with addition of memantine. And the underlying traits, be it ADHD-like traits or autistic traits, they may be responding to ethamoxetine, methylphenidate, naltrexone. So these have role in even in schizophrenia and mania or psychosis phenotype. But that is the neurobiological perspective. Current guidelines are still different. Thank you. I'll be stopping my screen share. Can I invite Bhaskar and Malay to just chip in with the questions and their comments? No Malay. question so far, just only one observation that Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Asag Reddy has asked, but we would come to that later. First, I want to congratulate Nichiketa for dealing with an impossible subject, basic science and pathophysiology of psychosis and mania is a subject on which a book series can be written. But to his credit, Nachiketa actually has done justice to this topic and given us a PG level wide overview. Now, we would in future from next uh, topic onwards, six or seven uh, seminars be taken on this various aspect of any and psychosis. With this, I am asking Dr. Malai Dabai to chip in. Uh, Bhaskar, there is a query, I think, so Dr. Paramvir Singh has raised his hand. If we can just mm. ask him what does he want? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, just, think like, uh, yeah, can I just wanted to uh, ask a question, if that's okay, if that can be asked verbally. I am not sure if I have to Yeah, yeah, it. please, please, yes, Paramvir, yes, please yes, go please, ahead. Yeah, yeah. Please so, go so, ahead. so, so, Nachiketa, you were going, talking when we were talking about pathophysiology, there was still a lot of focus on the dopamine and the glutamate. Now, I just want to know that still how, are we still saying that these neurotransmitters are important, number one? And number two, now we know that there are a lot of other neurotransmitters. There are thousands of neurotransmitters in the brain. So are we still saying that from what we know is that it's the dopamine and it is the glutamate, which is still important, which I know that has been taught to us in basics. And then we have, been, we have relearned that it's not just all neurotransmitters. There are circuits involved. There are some molecular pathways involved. But still, there was a lot of focus on neurotransmitters. So that was my question. Mm -hmm. Yes. First of all, as I mentioned before, the breadth of topic necessitated that I limited to something to demonstrate the approach rather than presenting a comprehensive overview. But yes, I agree. No neurotransmitter or rather a particular circuit acts alone. And yes, as you have rightly mentioned, there are thousands of neurotransmitters. But given the target audience of this presentation, I restricted it to more familiar terms that we can correlate with our teachings. Otherwise, what we commonly see is that the literature and the research is somehow not getting percolated and presented into main textbook. I'll be very frank and I'll give you my own example. While preparing this PPT, I went back to CTP and our standard textbooks. This CA3 and all those parts are already mentioned in those books. 
how did we miss that in our PG teachings? Something went wrong or something went amiss. And that's my primary take home, if you can say, that we need to look at these things. Now, coming to neurotransmitters, dopamitergic or glutamitergic, all those things, they are the first step in cell to cell or neuron to neuron communication. And we stop at studying D2 blockade or 5HT2 changes and we don't look what is happening inside the cell. Otherwise, these are the th same thing. Let's say dopamine D2. D2 blockade actually triggers PI3 AKT cascade. And that has so many implications, including uh, the same AKT pathway getting involved in reduced osteoblastic function which makes our patient already share diathesis with osteoporosis. So that's why our patients have tendency for fractures at later age. However, this is huge and quite overwhelming. We have not even yet completely understood the overview and outline of features at brain level. Then it's a totally different subject to talk about multi-systemic implications of same dysfunction. Otherwise, in one line, CNS and the psychiatric symptoms being CNS manifestations of multi-systemic uh, disorders affecting intracellular pathways. Yeah, Malay, can you just take over if there is comments from you? Yeah, so, yeah, uh, uh, well done. Nachiket, uh, it was uh, quite a good one. Uh, you could get in a lot of uh, basic concepts that are necessary when we need to have a, you know overall scientific uh, understanding of what psychosis is. At, at least the basic processes that underline the symptoms that we see. Uh, well, in, in one session, it could be an overview. And of course, as Bhaskar mentioned, uh, uh, detailed understanding of various systems, various circuits uh, would be sessions by themselves. So let's see what more we can do in that regard. So with that, uh, uh, I'll take the first question. Uh, it is from uh, Dr. K. Ashok Reddy. He, meant, he asks uh, whether there is any relation between dreams and disorganized thinking in schizophrenia, which are similar but differ in conscious states. Any, any, any Thoughts on that? Yeah, so, sir, uh, first of all, the thing would be, again, to look at dreams in neurobiological sense and what they are actually doing. Probably, as far as I can understand, it is related to the organization of memory that happens in sleep, so hippocampus may be involved. And then the concept of disturbances of sleep and wake state and that boundary, certain phenomena which are common in sleep, permeating conscious state or conscious phenomena in sleep, parasomnia and whole picture, they would come into play to answer this question, which is actually probably above my pay grade. I would like the comments from our mentors. Bhaskar, do you want to comment on this? Actually, this would be a very long answer. The thing is, dream itself is of various layers. Some dreams are triggering of long forgotten complex neuronal reflexes and present day human experience. Some dreams are triggered by something more mundane and so Dreams already are multi-layer thing and standing there. Disorganized thinking in schizophrenia is a very generalized term. Disorganized thinking means what? Is disorganization in cognitive process, disorganization in memory recall, disorganization in memory storage. We don't know that. So standing there, we can draw in number of conclusions at this point, but there would be no proof 
still we are able to observe brain states in real time without the help of surrogate markers. Why I said this? Because many of you would say, but there is functional neuroimaging and functional neuroimaging can actually show us brain states. No, it cannot. Functional neuroimaging, there are mostly of two kinds. Number one, fMRI. fMRI actually measures oxygen and deoxygenation status of RBCs. And that is a surrogate marker of brain activity. Similarly, FDG PET is surrogate marker of metabolic activity. That doesn't translate into real-time brain observation. Until we have that, we cannot really say how much interrelationship is there in between various states of dream, various types of dream, and various type of cognitive behavior seen in chronic psychosis. There are various relationships, but all of them are hypotheses. Okay. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, another question that comes up uh, is, uh, well, at least the screen name says only doctor, so I don't know the person and I mm. don't know his or her name. But the question that has been asked, uh, I mean, rather after a couple of comments, the question, uh, 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 I mean, after the comment that uh, Oleans is a chemosensitizer in reality due to its action on neuropeptides and action on innate immunity, the question that comes to you is, uh, there are two. One is, uh, what kind of sleep cycle disturbances in toddlers is indicative of future psychopathology? And do we need to intervene at that this stage? Yes. So, what do you have to say to so that? So far as we study these things, or rather we clinically take history and try to observe these things, if possible, we would like to start history from antenatal stage. But since the birth, we want to see whether a child establishes normal circadian rhythm or not. By the age of two or three months, most of the children or infants would have ability to stay awake for most part of day and stay asleep for most part of night. But sometimes we can elicit history, parents can recall whether, let's say the child was requiring very less sleep, he would sleep very less and he would play throughout the night or there is day night reversal, he is sleeping more in day and less in night. And the daytime awakening and nighttime sleep pattern takes a long time to establish, let's say, six months or so. These are the kind of history I could elicit in my patients. Yeah, so, so the so, intervention, huh, yeah, melatonin is, is one intervention. Yeah, no, the, the question that I think becomes important at this point is that suppose we know that there are definite uh, circadian rhythm disturbances and uh, we treat with whatever you want to treat with melatonin, melatonin, fine. Now, when we address these issues, does it prevent the future conversion of this individual into psychosis? Do we have any it data be hard on that? to say. No. There is no okay. data at this stage. There is yeah. no data at this stage whether treating these kind of sleep problems, there mm -hmm. are various kind of sleep problems yeah. in toddlers that indicate future neuropathology but mm. whether treating any of these deviances mm. have an impact at later stage there is no that. data okay. no data whatsoever okay fine the the second question uh, from the same uh, doctor is uh, mm, and also uh, from uh, i mean a couple of questions on the same line uh, by Dr. Param we're seeing also is uh, negative symptoms can be difficult to recognize and treat. What are some of the reason why it is so and how do we overcome these challenges? So this is one question. And the second one is, okay, fine. So you can talk on negative symptoms. Why is it difficult to pick them up and uh, why is it difficult to treat them? And then what do we do? How do we go around this or go about this? So the answer is actually multifaceted. 
first why they fly under the radar so to speak is because at times they have not understood the symptoms people would call that he became lazy ah hoga chalta hai so initially they may fly under the radar then the there comes the this, uh, question of uh, labeling them let's say somebody labels these symptoms as negative symptoms they would think of amisulpiride and related medicines but what if they are depressive symptoms we would think antidepressants all right let's say they are negative symptoms i want to give antidepressant should i there is some literature there is even the literature suggesting that ongoing antidepressant can actually prevent supposed psychotic relapses in future or at least slow it down or reduce frequency in a sense prophylactic role so that is one thing second this negative and cognitive symptoms are the lifelong stable traits and they would probably fluctuate in severity but they won't look as dramatic or disruptive as let's say hallucinatory patient or a patient with delusion and aggression so sometimes again flying under the radar that ha wo to pehle se hi aisa hai he has been quiet always okay he has been quiet why because it is related to autistic traits or is it some form of some amount of this symptoms but yes clinically these symptoms can be addressed by i mean neurobiologically speaking uh, antidepressants have a role atomoxetine methylphenidate has a role let's say the progression and neurodegeneration part memantine has a role the case i was talking about uh, being on risperidone for decades and having some kind of this negative symptom type presentation at the age of 55 60 male patient he did respond to addition of memantine i tried to lower his risperidone from 4 mg to 3 mg but uh, the symptoms came back so i had to go with 4 and 10 mg memantine okay so uh, so uh, correct me if i'm wrong that when we are talking about the concept of negative symptoms uh, first of all we need to understand that it is not one symptom right so if it is not one yes. symptom or uh, you know it is not uh, it is not variations of one symptom means it is not a mood state okay it is not uh, let's say a uh, uh, motivational state so there are different things so will it be wise that when we are talking of negative symptoms that we actually pinpoint what is the negative part of that negative symptoms means so basically is it a cognitive impairment in in the sense it is is it an attentional impairment that has been going on or is it a working memory deficit that has been going on or is it an emotional anhedonic state that is going on so why i'm why I'm, why i think this way is that it would be better if uh, rather than a broad label if you are able to you know kind of focus on what is the you know and try to be accurate about what is the actual clinical presentation we may be with whatever agents we have you know add or subtract something which would work which has a chance of working better rather than just negative symptoms so uh, do you think this is the correct way of looking at it obviously sir that would again focus on pinpointing the dysfunction at brain level in be it positive symptom or negative symptom we want to focus on the uh, neurobiologically oriented constructs yeah okay so then we have uh, another question uh, you mentioned memantine uh, at one or two places so does donapazil 2 have a role in slowing neurodegeneration in psychosis or a combination that, that we have donapazil with memantine do you think that is helpful so donapazil or donapazil plus memantine combination so i have come across very little literature on donapazil in schizophrenia but if i have to hazard a guess which is obviously hazardous i would say may have some role in dementia like picture or maybe some amount of apathy but it's very flimsy ground unless we have strong evidence to back it up we should not so so the question you know just a side on that uh, is uh, uh, in your talk you did mention about uh, dopamine you mentioned about glutamate you mentioned about the secondary uh, 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 the secondary cascade that happens in the in cell inside the cell and so on so uh, do you think that there is an involvement of the cholinergic circuits 
और कॉलिनेटिक कंपोनेंट्स बिकॉज सी मेमेंटिन इज एस्टेब्लिश एज एन एंटी ग्लूटामेटर्जिक एजेंट इट्स एन एनएमडीए कॉम्पिटेटिव एंटागोनिस्ट uh and donepezil is the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor so unless and until we have a substrate for that uh it may not work so do we have anything that the cognitive impairments or the negative symptoms that uh are uh, that that we see has got one of the components as acetylcholine or the cholinergic system and whether it is the muscarinic or the nicotinic hippocampal area and memory formation has connection with the uh, cholinergic system and uh, i am not able to recall on top of my head as of now but yeah that way it may have some role but still i could not come across the literature on it as readily as i could come across the literature on memantine it may be publication bias so that's okay so maybe we'll need to look at it more yes okay uh, another system actually has a lot of new focus in cognitive dysfunction and along with that various other deficit symptoms of so called chronic psychosis but the problem is we don't know yes cholinergic system is involved cholinergic system has a role but does that mean whether donepezil or memantine oh, sorry donepezil or rivastigmine or galantamine would work there or not there yeah. is no data for it yeah. uh, rather than i would say only galantamine and memantine has positive data rest all the things have no positive data yet yeah. and the positive data for galantamine is of recent on recent uh, times so it is not yet been screened and replicated okay so it's better to be scared Yeah, yeah. So, so memantin is, uh, you know, what we would kind of uh, look at more uh, than we need to, and think about it when we are dealing with negative symptoms and a ongoing process. Okay. So, Doctor Sunny Dua has a question for you. Uh, can you give detailed explanation of various developmental trajectories and longitudinal psychopathology at a later stage? So. well on 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 uh, nachiketa's behalf uh, we are planning to have more uh, than one session on uh, psychosis uh, the basic uh, sciences of psychosis so i think we will we will cover but uh, any any quick take away points on this nachiketa so uh, i would just look at broad strokes longitudinally first we need to understand what we are looking at at this stage now they... yeah okay okay Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, Vasco. Yeah. Yeah, Nachi. So, the, at the, what what would we we expect normally? What is the normal trajectory that we would expect at different stages? What kind of symptoms we are looking at for the childhood? Probably, we would be looking at expecting neurodevelopmental disorders more so called in terms of. DSM ICD over a period of time. First, we need to look at what are the steady traits and how they deviate from normal developmental trajectories. Most of the times, we can call it a form of lag of maturation or lag in particular area of functioning. And so, at different stage, it would present as different symptoms, but. this is just a broad outline of the approach when we go deep into individual trait let's say older concept was impulsive compulsive spectrum nowadays we consider that impulsivity and compulsivity are two separate but orthogonal domains so we'll have to map out each individual trajectory first and then we can comment more on this Okay, fine. So anyway, But, uh, let's see if we can have a, a, a more uh, in-depth discussion on this in uh, some of the later sessions on on the topic. Okay, so uh, two questions, and these two questions are on the role of antidepressants. So Dr. Paramvir Singh asks, can we say that all patients of psychosis should be given an antidepressant in addition to antipsychotics, unless otherwise contraindicated? That's one. And second is, uh, can giving antidepressants in the early phase To those who are more prone, 
basically vulnerability or diathesis that you talked about, uh, who are vulnerable to mania and psychosis or any psychiatric disorder prevent anything from happening in the future. So, one is whether we give uh, anti antidepressants to all patients unless otherwise contraindicated. And if uh, very early on in the uh, pathophysiology of the disorder, in the development of the disorder, if we give, does it prevent anything? So, on antidepressants. So, first thing is probably we'll need to do away with the concept of this uh, blanket selection. It would come down to patient and molecule matching. So, as a blanket statement, no. It needs to be considered individually in each case. Maybe most need it, but some don't need it. Now, the situation with mania is dicey. All over the world, guidelines still have not made a single consensus whether to give antidepressants in mania or not. But by and large, the guidelines are given by safety concerns in preventing manic switch. That is why we are almost hesitant or you can even say afraid of using antidepressants in mania and related things. Now the diathesis that I said, again as Malaysia said about negative symptoms, diathesis is not a single thing. It's a kind of a category and we need to look at the specific diathesis of that particular person and whether he would be helped by which molecule. Let's say even in antidepressants, we make club SSRIs in single group, but all have different functions. So one may be suited to the person, other may not be. And this kind of considerations, although this answer may look relatively hand wavy, but this is the reality that we need to match patient to molecule. Yeah. So again, uh, I'll I'll just give uh, my thoughts on this. So should we give antidepressants to all patients of uh, psychosis? Well, maybe not to start with, but uh, once the uh, you know the acute symptoms, the acute presentations, uh, which with which the patients are brought to us in the sense uh, uh, too much of behavior disturbance, aggression, psychosis. Once that part is kind of uh, managed and we are able to get more information, then it would be uh, worth a thought. I mean, it's not going to be on my prescription on day one itself. Unless the psychosis is very mild, unless uh, the the something from the negative symptom group is already there, uh, I might not start it on day one. But definitely, as the disorder progresses, uh, rather the treatment progresses, the improvement comes. What remains? What what is something that I have not addressed, or I mean, which was difficult to address in the first couple of uh, follow ups? Then definitely, I would uh, think of adding an SSRI. Uh, now, vulnerability to mania or psychosis. So, as you mentioned, Nachiketa, it is not, uh, it is not uh, something which is very easy to define. Uh, when when we look at uh, what people have done uh, with uh, with not the first episode psychotic patients, but the group which was uh, the group of patients or the cohort which is something called as at ultra high risk for psychosis means where they have a family history of psychosis, where they have certain uh, symptoms, so to say some hallucinatory experiences or some psychotic symptoms for a couple of days in a few days, in a week. And they're transient kind of symptoms. So if you have this cohort and we give them the title of at ultra high risk, so UHR group. So what has been observed? First, how do you manage them? And the two things that stand out is SSRIs and CBT. Or basically some kind of a doctor-patient thera doctor therapeutic alliance. So from the medication point of view, it is SSRIs. Now the bigger question is, how many of these UHR patients actually transition into, flu uh, into a full-blown psychosis and at what point in time, after one year, two year, five year, ten years? This nobody knows. So are we going to continue them on that and then say that people have remained stable or people who have not received SSRIs have broken? It's very difficult to actually split hairs on that. So the bottom line is that it may not prevent anything. The symptoms or the type of symptoms that are present at that time may be controlled. 
maybe the stress diathesis or the stress sensitivity is reduced. So the effect of external stressors may not be that bad. This is what is the idea. But does it prevent something completely? No, because if it was so, then the conversion rate in that UHR group would be zero, which is not which has not been uh, uh, you know uh, very. I mean, we have not seen it that way. So no. Uh, another question that is asked to you is uh, uh, this is. I think this is from Ritwik. He asks, uh, what about mementing? Would it help in most cases? Your thoughts? Well, mementing does have significant literature. Some 2017 reviews also suggested its role in positive symptoms, not just negative. We know that mementing has a role in OC-like symptoms also. We use it in augmentation. And definitely there are studies showing its effect in the negative and cognitive symptoms. So yes, it does seem to have a role in almost all the symptom domains. As of now, clinically, we are not just limited by, new, uh, I mean, we are limited with certain other factors also, guidelines and other things. Ideally, I would like to look at the dysfunction and yes, I would like to start maintaining in most cases sooner or later, depending on the presentation. Okay. Okay, and I think the last uh, kind of comment and uh, note, uh, rather a question is uh, something like this. Uh, would it be correct to summarize? We have breaks for this process, or for the trajectory. It is in the form of antipsychotics. When we want to race or accelerate, we have antidepressant. So we want to start with one and add other as the case as we move along the course and if there are too many breaks then we add mementing so is 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 this something that you would suggest this is uh, the question also mentions a kind of a disclaimer that uh, we do not want to be very reductionist you know reduce everything to just two or three drugs but do you think this is how we would or we should look at it or is there something that you would like to add to this i would like to modify this a metaphor or example a little bit. Uh, antipsychotics, yes, they do seem to reduce cellular metabolism or cellular activity. So they would have this break kind of things. However, that is at cellular level. Let's say standard typical example of paradoxical worsening of OC symptoms with antipsychotics. If amygdala hyperactivity is reduced with antipsychotics, it is beneficial. But beyond certain doses, it also reduces frontal function. So at molecular level, yes, it is reducing function. Now the thing with antidepressants is, we won't call it simply the accelerator. We would say it improves cerebral functioning on the whole. It helps with the allostasis part and thereby different brain areas are able to function what they are supposed to or at close to what they are supposed to and that's how it brings about the improvement in say be it depression or any other pathology uh, symptoms that we see clinically so yes however as a clinical judgment maybe we can think in those terms but then again anticonvulsants are also breaks they reduce neuronal conduction and probably when we are talking of manic stage they may have slightly faster onset of effect to anticonvulsants as compared to antipsychotics. And this is notwithstanding their sedative property. Because clinically, even that sedative property will make it appear reduction in aggression and all those things. Okay. Uh, uh, I think we have had a good uh, presentation and a equally good discussion on today's topic. Uh, thank you, Nachiketa, for a uh, My for a nice, nicely done uh, talk. And with that, I would hand over the proceedings to Dr. Rajkumar. So over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Nachiketa. It was a good presentation and a good interaction with the people. Uh, I just wish to convey to all the attendees that the next four classes will be done by Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee, who will be dealing on these topics in a little more detail. 
So keep yourselves ready to hear, to listen to him in the next four classes that is going to be in January and February. With that, good night to all of you and thank you to the uh, neuro, uh, Neuroscience Division of Alchem. Good night to all of you. Good night, everyone.